Hello, welcome. In this video, I'm going to explain to you why a two-stroke engine such as a chainsaw or a strimmer can work vertical, horizontal and upside down. I'm going to show the fascinating intricacies that allow these engines to work in any direction and that's the reason why they're used in small garden machinery such as strimmers, chainsaws, etc. that are used in all different positions. In fact, without the good old two-stroke, we wouldn't have machines out there with this level of manoeuvrability at the price that they're available to us at. We might well be able to find a new engine more like a four stroke that can work in all directions but it will be at a different price so we need to respect these little engines so there's our two stroke engine first of all let's take a look at why a four stroke engine can't work on its side or upside down but it all relates to the actual engine oil inside the sump here and so why is that then well let's turn one of these engines on its side and take a look we certainly wouldn't need to get the engine in this extreme horizontal position in order to have problems here in fact in this position the engine probably wouldn't run at all i'm just over emphasizing this just for the sake of putting my information across. The engine oil would be in this position of course because it's a fluid. Even before the engine started the fluid will start to go up towards the piston and gradually seep up alongside of it even though there's a very very tight clearance there between the piston and the cylinder. And when the engine starts and the piston begins to lower two main things happen. First of all that lowering piston slaps into that oil that was sitting behind it and that lowers the piston's speed and efficiency. Some of that oil a small amount might manages to seep past the piston rings and find itself at the top of the piston where it shouldn't be. And as that speed reduced piston comes down even further to bottom dead centre, it experiences even more resistance from it. Plus, we've got oil that's gathering between the piston and the cylinder and that's creating a drag on the piston. The gap between the piston and the cylinder wouldn't be this large. I've had to emphasise it this much in order to get my point across. And so the piston now is moving far slower and less efficient than it would be than if the engine was sitting upright and so as that piston starts to rise again all of that oil that came past the piston ring which is now sitting in front of the cylinder is now causing a drag on the piston itself also we've got the drag from the oil in between the piston and the cylinder and when the piston gets to top dead center on the power stroke where it should be compressing just air and fuel it's also trying to compress all of that oil and that's causing problems now with combustion because when the spark plug fires instead of it igniting that rich mix of air and fuel in order for a great combustion in there to allow the piston to be pushed back down. Instead, it's trying to ignite the fuel and air as well as this oil. And this engine oil is nowhere near as ignitable. So the factors now reducing the efficiency of this piston are that it was already coming up to this point at a reduced rate as we saw. And now combustions took place, the piston will be pushed back down that cylinder. And instead of traveling down the cylinder at a high rate as a result of a good combustion, we've actually got a substandard combustion that's occurred because of the oil that was in there so we didn't have the same explosion so it's now traveling down that cylinder at a lower rate and as if that wasn't enough we've still got the oil drag this side of the piston as we did before as the pistons lowering and if we were to take a look above the piston now in the wake of the combustion that's just occurred it would actually look more like this there would be so much more waste in there in the form of blue or black smoke as a result of that incomplete combustion and so that piston goes all the way down to the bottom of the cylinder now to its lowermost point with of course all of these drag points that the oil's creating and as the piston lowered we're still going to get some of that oil seeping past the piston ring and then entering the top of the piston again okay so now the piston's coming back up and we've still got that drag there because we've still got that oil between the piston and the cylinder and on top of that slowing it even further we've also got that oil on top of the piston and it's trying to push into that and it's slowing the piston down and of course as the piston comes up it's pushing all of those exhaust fumes out the exhaust valve and out of the exhaust it's going to be thick blue or thick black smoke and at the same time this oil that's actually seeped past the piston on this stroke also starts to get forced out of that exhaust valve there and through the exhaust ultimately as the piston travels up further the oil here can cause component damage we'll revert back to the engine as the pistons rising on the compression stroke and the oil seeps past the piston there what can sometimes happen is more oil ends up at the top of the piston here so when the piston rises further into the compression stroke it actually hits all of that oil and as we know oil is incompressible and because the pistons moving quite fast it hits that oil but it stops dead and doesn't go any further remember the oil can't be forced out anywhere to give relief from this pressure because we've got both valves closed because we're on the compression stroke now because before all of this we had a lot of drag with this piston and incomplete combustion meaning it wasn't moving as fast as it should be this piston might likely come up and hit this oil 
and just stop the engine without any further damage. But if the pistons move in much quicker wherever possible and then hits this wall of oil then it's going to create some damage somewhere, some physical trauma. The conrod can sometimes shear and when this does happen where the pistons stop by the oil like this we call it hydraulic locking and I have seen this happen a few times. But the damage that occurs generally affects the conrods or the end caps here. There are other areas that can be affected like the flywheel, sometimes the key that locks the flywheel wheel onto the shaft there in a certain place can shear and allow the flywheel to turn unnaturally in an unnatural position. And another reason we can't use a four stroke engine on its side like this is the carburetor. Underneath here we've got the float chamber which is basically a fuel reservoir and this is another very important reason we can't turn the engine onto its side. And so to better explain my point on this I can take this carburetor now and put it in situ onto the engine. If we tip this engine onto its side in doing so now that fuel can start to seep in through the main jet and start to drip down into the inlet manifold of the engine. It seeps past the inlet valve depending what position the inlet valve's in and when it does go through it starts to congregate in the cylinder. Remember this engine isn't yet running it's just been left on its side in its stopped position. But what we tend to find here as with the oil when it seeps past the piston rings we get the same problem because the fuel is so light it's not as thick and viscous as oil is it seeps past the piston rings and in doing so it starts to mix with the engine oil reducing the quality obviously the ability of that engine oil to lubricate because it's thinning the oil down and also it's increasing the fluid mass inside the crankcase. Taking a look at the carburetor in its normal position then we see that it needs to be in this position in order for it to function correctly we know that because we need a supply of fuel fed by gravity to this particular type and it's that gravity feed of course which fills the bottom of the float chamber here and that of course means that we have to have a fuel tank that's positioned higher than the carburetor in order for it to feed the carb. But as we'll see the two-stroke carburetor is very much different. Okay so that's why a four-stroke engine can't work on its side. So let's have a look now why a two-stroke engine can. We haven't got any of that oil inside the crankcase here. As we know we mix the two-stroke engines lubricating oil with the fuel. Either that or it's injected in a little later as it goes into the engine. But nevertheless as the engine uses the fuel it also draws all that lubrication in and it lubricates all the parts of the engine as it uses the fuel. But the moral of the story is there's no oil down here in the crankcase like there is in a four stroke and so we can use this engine in any position like this. And that includes being able to run just as efficiently upside down. And so this relates to how the engine can do this then but what about the carburetor? Let's take a look at that. We took a look at the four stroke carburetor and we saw that because of the fuel inside the float chamber we can't tip this actual carburetor onto its side. The two stroke carburetor is very much different. And one main difference we'll notice is that we've got a fuel pump here. So this carburetor doesn't actually have to rely on gravity in order to feed it the fuel. This carburetor pumps its own fuel through and if we're trying to start the engine of course we'd have air here coming through the inlet area and it's that air that creates a vacuum as I've shown in my other videos drawing out of the main jet. It pulls this diaphragm down. This is the metering diaphragm and as it does so the metering diaphragm physically pushes the back of the metering lever there upwards and because it's pivoted in the middle it pushes the front downwards and down with it comes the needle valve and that now makes an open channel for the pressurized fuel to flood into the metering area and when it reaches the main jet it can then be drawn out of the main jet by that vacuum and so now with this vacuum pressure pulling out the fuel and the pumping pressure of that fuel pump at the top pumping the fuel round to this area we've got a constant supply of fuel in order for the engine to run correctly and it can provide that fuel regardless of the position that the carburetor in whether it be on the side like this or upside down any position whatsoever. The carburetor will continue to function normally and it's designed this way purposely and we can see now why. And something else that allows this two stroke engine to work upside down is the fuel tank. And as we can see on this simplified drawing we've got the fuel here as red in the fuel tank and we've got this fuel pipe that goes and feeds the carburetor. And what's characteristic of these small two stroke engines like this is that we have the filter which can reach right across the other side of the fuel tank because it's connected to an internal fuel pipe which is connected to the main pipe that feeds the carburetor. So because of this pipe then fuel can be picked up and used inside the carburetor regardless of which orientation this fuel tank is in. So let's take a look at it on its side. If we look there we can see that all the fuel has dropped to the bottom but because we've got this pipe allowing this fuel filter to drop into that fuel it can still suck fuel out in this position. And so let's have a look what happens now if we turn this fuel tank totally upside down. Of course the fuel drops to the bottom as it should do and 
what we've got again is the fuel filter that's inside the fuel again so it's still sucking up the fuel what happens when the fuel tank is tilted this way we can see there that the fuel has followed its usual path with gravity and it's gone to the bottom area of the tank and what we can see there with the fuel pipe is that it's sort of bowed over and the fuel filter is where it should be because the fuel filter is moving under its own weight and that's what's allowing this to happen we've got fuel being able to be drawn out of the fuel tank no problem whatsoever and out to the carburetor again in a good feed and I hope that goes a long way to explaining why and how the good old two-stroke can run and function normally in any orientation and so at that I want to thank you so much for watching this video through to the end here are some more videos in the links to help you on your way and if you are getting any running or starting problems from your chainsaw then please do take a look down in the description below I've got a free download for you there it's a checklist of must do's should you be experiencing such problems the link takes you straight through to my website on the page of the download please like and subscribe if you haven't done so already and I'll be back soon thank you for watching